Hello and welcome back to CS420, a course on game hacking. So last video we ended on a cliffhanger. We learned that when you exit a game and relaunch it, sometimes the hacks still work and sometimes they don't. To understand why this happens, we need to learn about something called virtual memory. Remember this diagram? This is what happens when an executable file is double clicked. The operating system copies it from the hard drive into RAM and then we start hacking the copy in RAM. Let's dive a little deeper into what happens here. When the program first runs, it's given its own set of virtual memory. One way to look at virtual memory is the limit of how much RAM a program can use. This is a slight simplification, but it's a sufficient way for us to think about it. This game has a limit of 4 GB of RAM. However, a large chunk of memory is reserved for system use. So in reality, our limit is about 2 GB. We don't care about this system memory section, so we're just going to ignore it. So let's zoom in on the parts we care about. In reality, we have a limit of 2 GB that the game can use, and 64-bit programs have a much larger limit than this, but for now we're going to focus on the 32-bit version. This means that if we have 128 GB of RAM, this game can potentially use 2 GB of the total 128. This means when our game first runs, we have our copied exe, and we have a large amount of free memory that we can potentially use. So first, let's learn a little bit more about what's going on in this blue section, the copied exe. Within our copied exe, we have various sections. The two important ones are data and code. We've learned a lot about data already, and we'll learn more about code later. The important thing to know is that code can create new data. So here we have another chunk of data created outside of the copied exe. So what does this look like? Here we have our blue section up top with the copied exe file. Once the exe gets loaded into virtual memory and its code starts running, it might load up the user interface and then it might load up the world and the world in turn will load up the player and enemies and all sorts of objects. Now you can think of this tree as being much larger than shown here. For example, the arrow shooting off here might be the sound system and the player might have an inventory, and the inventory might have items, and there might be a tile map in the world, right? In a real game, this tree would be quite massive. Now, it's important to note that all of these objects are just data, with the exception of the exe, which also has code, which again, we'll cover later. Uh, for example, the player inside here, we might have the player's x position, y position, health, mana. The enemy would have the same, but for the enemy, obviously, and so on. So let's take a look at this diagram and see what it looks like in memory. Okay, here we have the same diagram but flattened out. This is how the program actually looks when laid out in virtual memory. When an object is created, it's known as an allocation. So maybe we have the world here in green. It's been allocated to this position. And players and enemies in purple. When an object is deleted, it's known as a deallocation. For example, if we press pause and go to the title screen, most of these objects will get deleted, they will get deallocated. The blank spaces represent free memory or unallocated memory. This is just blank spaces where allocated objects can potentially go. Here is something important to note. When objects are allocated, they are allocated at random positions. So if we took the same game, closed it, and opened it again, it might end up like this. Uh, the objects start at different addresses in memory. See, there's the green object up top. Run it again, and it's in a different spot. So let's walk back this through the beginning. Here we have all of our game objects. Restart the game, restart the game, restart the game. Kind of always a different position. Now, this is often why cheats stop working. Right, this is address zero up here and address two billion, give or take, down here. And the player X and Y might be in this purple section here. And if every time the game runs, it's going to be at a different address. Uh, this means that the address you found in Squalor or Cheat Engine is not going to be valid anymore. The only section that is reliable is this blue section here, where the EXE was originally copied over. This means that any hacks you develop using information in the blue section will continue to work every time the game runs. This information is known as static. 
Its position never changes. Everything else is dynamic. Their positions can change. Uh, before we move on, technically I lied a little bit. The main section can theoretically be loaded anywhere in free virtual memory. Uh, usually it loads into the exact same spot, but the OS can put it anywhere. But it doesn't really matter. Once it's loaded, it will stay in that spot when the program runs, and we can actually ask the operating system where it copied the EXE, which means we can super easily find this section. Jumping back to this diagram, the blue section we can track down easily, but allocated objects are random, making them much more challenging to track down. Instead of just looking at diagrams, I want to show you a real example of how the EXE gets loaded into virtual memory. So we have the Squally EXE here on disk. If we drag this into HXD, it's mostly gibberish, but there's a few pieces of clear information that we can read, right? We have this program cannot be run in DOS mode, this text, our data, data, right? Some clear English that we can read. So if we minimize this out and go into Cheat Engine, we theoretically should be able to find that same information in virtual memory. So it's already attached to Squally. I go into memory view here. And Cheat Engine has a cool trick where I can hit go to address and I can type in squally.exe. And what this does is it will find the address that this exe was loaded. So here we are, it was loaded at address 00B10000. And what do we see? This program cannot be run in DOS mode, rich PE. They have that text, our data, data, the same thing that we saw on disk. So here's a clear example of how it was copied from disk to virtual memory. Now let's return to this diagram, except now we're going to do something interesting. The programmer can mark certain pieces of information as static. In this example, the player's health and position are marked as static. That means they're kept up here rather than down here. Now, generally, this is considered bad practice, right? Bad design, since now you have the player's information in two different places, right? Maybe down here, you still have the player's inventory and mana. And architecturally, this is quite messy. However, this makes it easier to program, especially for novice programmers. The reason for this is maybe that, for example, the user interface might need access to the player's health. Well, it turns out that if it's up here, it's only one hop away and it's quite easy to access. If it's all the way down here, the game needs to somehow communicate to the user interface what's happening way over here, and it's much trickier to program. So many programmers just do it the lazy way. They make the player's health static and they move on. Now, here's a thought experiment. What if instead of making the player's information static, we made the enemy's information static? So up here we have enemy health and enemy X. With the player, this wasn't such a big deal because there's only one player, but with the enemy, we have an issue because there can be many enemies. This means that every enemy in a game would end up sharing health, which doesn't work. And just to show you a cool example, I've thrown together a demo showing what would happen if we made enemy health static. So now I have that same example from before, except now there's three enemies loaded instead of one. And if I go into the code, the enemy's health is marked as static. So you have static integer health. So if I go into the game and I pull this lever, all of them get hit by the fireball at once and they all share health. It's just crazy behavior. Obviously, this doesn't really work in a game. You can't mark enemy health as static. So that's it for static memory. Next lecture, we'll learn more about virtual memory, specifically allocated objects, and we'll learn about something called pointers. This will help us hack information that isn't static. But for now, if you have questions or comments, drop a comment below. Thanks for watching.